Hello, friends, on this glorious day on the TED stage, the idea that I would like to share with you is how to find happiness in your career, and boy, am I excited about it. Let's do this. What is a career? We're going to start by creating a little bit of context for what a career actually is. Uh, the fine folks at Google define a career as an occupation undertaken for a significant period of a person's life and with opportunities for progress, whereas a job is a paid position of regular employment. Jobs largely stay the same. Careers grow and evolve. Uh, jobs are typically just about earning some cash. Careers can be so much more. Um, as such, a career can be a harder thing to establish than a job, and sometimes you need a job to sustain yourself while you pursue a career. Now, it's a different era for careers today than ever before, and there's a couple reasons for this. The first is increased access. Um, you know, a young person today can get on the internet and develop their interests and explore the world and make connections and develop networks in ways that you couldn't do in the past. That's a huge benefit. At the same time, it results in a big increase in competition because everyone else has the same access. At the same time, the ability to learn and grow and empower yourself to evolve as a professional is so much greater with access to the internet. So the standard of performance and knowledge and skill set has increased dramatically. Um, and that is reflected in the competition and the increased standards as well. Bottom line is the next 10 to 15 years will be the most innovative in human history. And that's from a 2013 uh, Deloitte uh, University paper, uh, so we're already in the thick of it. There's really never been a more exciting time to be a young person entering the workforce or a, uh, a person in this workforce, period. So, oh, what's going on in its own? That's cool. Um, when you talk about uh, a career and what the right career is for you, um, you got to first ask yourself, what is your objective? And um, so often, it's money, right? We need a career so we can make money. I want to take it a step further and break it down into three parts. Money, lifestyle, and love, okay? Now, perhaps too often of the time, money dominates the conversation, um, but it is a part of the conversation. It's an important part. So um, we're going to start there. But first, I want to give you guys a glimpse of my own career journey um, to see how I've put these principles in practice. My love is art. And going back to high school, I wanted to make art for a living. I wanted to be a musician. I quickly realized that not only is it extremely difficult to make money at art, in order to make money at art, you might have to compromise the things that caused you to love art in the first place in order to make that money. So I got pretty discouraged and started looking for alternatives. I found wine when I turned 21, wine, beer, and spirits. And I, saw, I realized that a lot of what I love about art and music could be found in wine, beer, and spirits. What these distillers, these brewers, these winemakers were doing, they were practicing a different kind of art. So I jumped into it head first and just started learning everything that I could about wine. I'm 22 years old you know, 21, 22 years old. And by the time I was 23 years old, I took over the wine program as head sommelier at one of the most prestigious accounts on the planet Earth, the Beverly Hills Hotel. I poured wine for A-list celebrities, for world leaders, anyone that you could imagine. And it was a dream job. But I wanted to see, can I do more with art? How can I, this is great and I love it, but how can I do more with art? So we launched a print magazine inspired by the great Dr. Hunter S. Thompson about wine, beer, and spirits. Now I'm doing photography and writing articles and working with other people and being an editor, and I'm bringing my passion to life, uh, for art to life in grand and glorious new ways. That led to doing philanthropic work with water relief in places like Nepal through the magazine. Uh, we did things like the Mutineer Holiday Comedy Festival where we could take our passion for comedy and do something good, raising money for water relief and bring these grand projects to life. And then I fell into marketing and I'm like, wow, marketing is really just art with a commercial side to it. So I became executive director of education at Anchor Distilling Company in San Francisco, one of the most iconic craft distilleries in both the United States and the world. And here I'm just taking pictures, doing more 
art, making more money than I ever thought I could as an artist. Fast forward, then I'm making short films, such as this one in Japan about Japanese bartending culture, up to and including a feature-length film that we did last year that showed at a major film festival about the intersection of politics and drink culture in Peru. I had no idea that all of these artistic opportunities existed for me as a career path until I embarked on that path and let those opportunities present themselves to me. So we have these three concepts. As I said, it's not all about money, but money's a big deal, so we will start there. Fascinating study right here. This is a study by Daniel Kahneman and Angus Deaton from Princeton University. They looked at results from a Gallup study of 450,000 people and came up with high income improves evaluation of life, but not emotional well-being. Expanding on this, their final conclusion was, we conclude that high income buys life satisfaction, but not happiness, and that low income is associated with both low life evaluation and low emotional well-being. Okay, so low income is a lose-lose. Moving on from there, let's see what they mean when they use these words happiness or emotional well-being. They define it as, the emotional quality of an individual's everyday experience, the frequency and intensity of experiences of joy, stress, sadness, anger, and affection that make one's life pleasant or unpleasant. To me, that seems pretty important in terms of one's life experience. Let's contrast this to the other side of it, life satisfaction or life evaluation, the thoughts that people have about their life when they think about it doesn't seem as important to me. And really, if you want to go deep, it's absolutely meaningless because how do you feel about your life? Well, it depends what day of the week it is and whether you've had your coffee or not, right? Like it's a constantly changing thing and it's all really just an illusion. It's only as meaningful as we make it. So the key question becomes, okay, so the study that they did they, they set this point, right? So they determined that the national average in the United States for household income is $75,000. Once you hit that $75,000 for household income, any additional money you make will not contribute to additional happiness. It might make you feel better about yourself, but it won't make you more happy. Um, there's an additional uh, extrapolation that's done to take into account inflation, because these numbers are from 2009, as well as cost of living based on where you live. Um, it ranged from like 61,000 in Mississippi to like 107,000 in Hawaii. But the concept here isn't based on what the actual number is, it's that there is a tipping point where you make enough money, happiness ceases to improve, and it's just how you feel about yourself. So, once you hit that benchmark, whatever it is, is the additional effort required for more income worth the effort to get that extra satisfaction? I think that the answer is no, absolutely no. And the reason why is it's not about judging the merit of whether life satisfaction is worth it or not. I think you can get a lot more life satisfaction in other ways, not through increased income. And as it relates to income, this idea of the emotional quality of your life experience that's what it's all about. That's what you need to get right. You can figure out the life evaluation stuff in other ways. So the thing I like about this study is they've made an attempt to put a backstop on the rat race because once you get in it, it's all about how do I make more money? How do I get more security? How do I make more money? And you think you know how much you need to make or you want to make, but once you start down that path, you realize the finish line moves and you never stop. And that can come at the expense um, of other things in your life. And again, when I started on my journey, um, I knew I needed to make money. I had no idea what it looked like. And the way that it turned out to work for me was nothing like I envisioned. So money is an important part of it, but it's just one part of it. And at least we gave ourselves a way of thinking about it. Um, the second thing is what is important to you? Your career does not exist in a vacuum. It's one part of your life experience, and the career choices you make are going to impact other aspects of your life experience. Do you want a family? And if you want a family, do you want to be around to experience that family? Do you want to travel? 
Do you not want to travel? Maybe you're in your 20s and you're single and that's the time to travel the world and be a free spirit and experience as much as you can. Maybe you're in your late 30s, early 40s with a family and travel is the last thing. I remember when I started working in, in beverage marketing, I got to fly all over the world and do art projects at distilleries and the other guys, the older guys are like, oh, you go do that, that's fine. I'm like, you guys don't want to go? This is crazy, this is so much fun. And um, it just depends on where you're at. Um, do you want structure or do you want freedom? Do you want predictability or do you want change? Do you want intense or relaxed, formal, formal or casual? Um, do you want to make room for your other hobbies and interests, work from home, commute, mornings or nights? At the very least, know where you stand on these things. If you want extra credit, try and predict where you're going to be in 10 years so you set yourself up for success. But at the very least, if you know what's important to you, you can be mindful about how you try and integrate those things into the career that you build for yourself. So money, uh, lifestyle, and how it fits in. Third and most important is love. And by love, I mean you need to do something that you love. Now, what if you don't know what you love? You got to live a little. You got to get out there. You got to put yourself out there. You have to make yourself vulnerable. You have to try new things. If you sit around and think about what you love, you'll never figure it out. So figure out what you love so you have some sort of direction with all of this. Because once you figure out what you love, all you got to do is practice. That's it. If you practice what you love, you will succeed, okay? That's how I approach my work. Think about a doctor. They don't just do their work. They have a medical practice. They go to work every day and they practice their trade. It's constantly evolving. Take that same concept and whatever the work it is that you're doing, treat it like a practice. You're not trying to do a task to get it done. You're trying to do a task to do a task. It's like watching a movie. When I'm done watching a movie, I'm not like, yeah, got that done. I'm like, oh, man, that was great, and now it's over. Every task is an opportunity to practice. It's not a burden. It's an opportunity to practice. If you take this approach to your work with something that you love, you will succeed, guaranteed. These are the words of legendary NFL coach Bill Walsh. I directed our focus less to the prize of victory than to the process of improving, obsessing perhaps about the quality of our execution and the content of our thinking, that is, our actions and attitude. I knew if I did that, winning would take care of itself. You look here, obsessing perhaps about the quality of our execution and the content of our thinking. He's talking about practice. If you don't worry about the outcome, if you don't worry about the win, and you devote every last ounce of energy you have to the practice, to the task at hand, the score will take care of itself. Crazy, right? So the alternative, what's the alternative to this? You could just try and say, well, how do I make the most money? Boom, that direction. I'm going to go that way and make that money. And um, I can do this. I might not love it, but I'll just, you know, I'm not going to get fired. I'll be on cruise control. And, oh, this isn't very fun, but at least I'm making good money, you know, and like, Check this out, right? So um, this is a CBS News report from March 2017 about a Gallup study by Anna Robitin titled, Why So Many Americans Hate Their Jobs. And it said this, two-thirds are disengaged at work, or worse. Half of the country's approximately 100 million full-time employees, 51% aren't engaged at work, meaning they feel no real connection to their jobs, and thus they tend to do the bare minimum. Another 16% are actively disengaged. They resent their jobs, tend to gripe to coworkers, and drag down office morale as a result. So on the one hand, these concepts I'm talking about might seem obvious, and like, duh, isn't that what you do? But 67% of the American workforce hasn't gotten it right, okay? So if you think of the rest of the workforce as your competition, 67% of them don't even want to be there. All right, so if you approach it with passion, you're immediately catapulted into the 68th percentile just because you care, right? And it's not about not getting fired. There's a big difference between not losing and succeeding. And it's not about being successful, it's about being exceptional because if you're exceptional, again, the score will take care of itself. Now, how do you become exceptional? You practice, right? 
So simple. Now, let's go over the three things we talked about. Money. Determine what makes sense for you. Keep in mind the happiness benchmark. The specific number isn't important. What is important is knowing how that number fits into the rest of your life. And when you look at it this way, a lower salary, maybe before this, you'd say, that salary's not enough. I need to make more than that. I can make more than that. But at what cost? Maybe a lower salary with more time with your family or the chance to travel the world. or the ch There's other ways to be compensated than just a paycheck. Number two, lifestyle. Identify those things that are important to you. Figure out how to integrate them into your career. You may not get your wish list right away. You probably won't. But by knowing what's important, you give yourself so much guidance uh, in terms of where you're working towards over time. Because when you're thinking about jobs and stuff, a lot of times the hardest part is just, man, I have no idea what to do. I got two opportunities. What do I do? By knowing these kinds of priorities for yourself, you give yourself some sort of framework to evaluate these opportunities. Finally, love. Make the effort to figure out what you love and build a career around it. You need to practice, never stop practicing, become exceptional, and spoil alert, you will succeed. Now, in my experience, far too many people underestimate their ability. And by association, they underestimate the potential tied to this ability. Simply put, find something that you love, believe that you can do it, practice it, do it better than anyone else, become exceptional, and the score will take care of itself. Thank you.